Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to call this meeting to order. This is a regular school board meeting, December 18, 2007. It is 5.30 p.m., and we're at the administration building here at 1900 Price Road. Please rise for a moment of silence, followed immediately by the Pledge of Allegiance. Can I say a few words? Powers. Thank you. I want to send our condolences out to a real good friend of mine who was a classmate of mine at UTSA, uh, Manny Del Castillo, the dentist, to his family. We offer condolences to him and his family. We wish him anything but the best. So we pray for them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Powers. Face the flag. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, Thank you. We were doing so well with the Texas flag. <laughs> Mr. Dr. Escobedo, everything was so quiet. Everything was very quiet. Nobody but wanted more to. energy left. I think they're waiting for Christmas. Right? Everyone's already trying to uh, on, on Christmas mode. Um, moving on to item four, the record, Mr. Colunga and Mrs. Galvan are not here. I, I didn't hear from them. I don't know if they'll show up sh uh, later on. <coughs> item five, recommend approving the agenda of the regular school board meeting of December 18, 2007. With any corrections or deletions, Mr. Gonzalez. Thank you, Dr. Escobedo. Members of the board, we do have a couple of uh, corrections. Uh, under general function A, item number nine, Page 149A is to be added. That's page 49A on item number nine. You and you have it there with you. And then also <coughs> under uh, general function bids, proposals, and pur purchases, item number 21, page 146A will be will replace page 146. So 146 is being replaced by 146A. And under close meet, meeting personnel matters, item number 24, pages 161, 162, and 163 will be pulled from the agenda backup. 161, 162, and 163. <clears throat> Do you have a motion to uh, approve the consent agenda? I have a motion by Mr. Parrish, seconded by Mr. Cortez. All in favor, raise your right hand. All right. The motion passes unanimously. <clears throat> Moving on to item six. Recommend approving the minutes of the regular board meeting of December 4, 2007. With any corrections, I will open the floor for any corrections on the minutes. If not, do I have a motion to approve the minutes as read? I, um, I move to approve. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mr. Cortez. All in favor, raise your right hand. Aye. All opposed? No, I'm going to abstain because at that day I was in the hospital. Okay. Uh, motion passes with everyone but Mr. Powers abstaining. Moving on to item seven, Superintendent's Report A, Conference Presentation One, Presentation of Senate Bill Nine, Fingerprinting Procedures for Non-Certified Employees. Mr. Gonzalez. Thank you, Dr. Scarello, members of the board. We're going to do a little presentation on, and you have a lot of the backup already on what Senate Bill Nine is. It's, it's requiring that non-certified employees be <coughs> fingerprinted starting January 1st before they're employed. There's a cost to it, and it's a requirement of law. And uh, I'll have uh, Ms. Fox. Assistant Superintendent for HR to give a brief presentation, Ms. Fox. Thank you, Mr. Gonzalez, Dr. Escobedo, members of the board. As Mr. Gonzalez uh, said, the Senate Bill 9 becomes effective January 1st, 2008. We have begun the process of developing procedures and timelines for getting that done. All staff members will have gone through some type of criminal record check, name-based check, fingerprinting, et cetera by September 11th of 2011. But we begin the process with fingerprinting procedures for non-certified employees that we hire beginning January 1st. Those non-certified employees are both classified and certified types of employees. Just as an example, with Mr. Sanchez's departure as CFO, we will be posting and advertising and ultimately hiring a CFO. That position does not require a certificate by TEA or the State Board of Education. Therefore, that, person is con that position is considered a non-certified employee, even though in the eyes of BISD he is a certified employee. So we're looking initially to start with 
non-certified employees, those are those employees hired after January 1st whose job position does not require a certificate from TEA. So just as an example, those are, that's the first group of people we will be um, working with in fingerprinting. If you look on page 15 and 16, we have a brief summary of, of the process that we're going to use initially for those non-certified employees that are hired after January 1st. As Mr. Gonzalez said, there's a cost of, is initially started at $57 per employee. The state has now reduced that price to $52 per employee and the employee is responsible for paying that fee. They must uh, go through the process as you see on page 15. They must uh, get a fingerprint pass form, pay their fees and go down to the uh, local <coughs> vendor who has been contracted by DPS to perform those fingerprinting uh, procedures. That is, the, f the vendor in Brownsville is Lindale Pharmacy down mm -hmm. here on Paredes Line Road. They uh, were part of the contract that DPS issued. So the process is all takes place online. The employee or the, the person seeking employment must pay online with a credit card. Either the district can pay with the credit card from the district's credit card or the individual employee, but the responsibility for paying is the, the person seeking employment. If you look on page 16, we also listed a couple of other groupings that we're going to be working with contractors, those people who are working directly with students, and in most cases that's in the special education program, our substitutes, volunteers, ultimately the currently certified employees by 2011, and then the current non-certified employees. Also on page 17 and 18, we've provided you just with a checklist that was provided to us by TEA, kind of a brief and quick overview of who will be getting what. Some will require actual fingerprinting, others will, current employees will require name-based checks and other criminal record checks. So. We, as we begin this process, we're going to take category by category of employees to ultimately by 2011 have all 8,000 employees in addition to that, substitutes, volunteers, student teachers, and other contractors that work with the district. <coughs> it's a massive project, but the, it's required by law. Our biggest issue, I think, at this point is going to be the time factor that it will take when an employee first applies for a job. We do the criminal record check. We do all the things that we do normally now. And then in addition to that, the, the prospective employee must pay the fee. And then <coughs> we wait for the results before that person can ever be put on to work. Hopefully it's not going to delay the process of getting people on the job, but waiting for the results of the fingerprinting, et cetera, is, of utmost importance to us not to put the wrong person in a sensitive position as teaching or employed for the district. So we're looking to begin this just immediately, January 7th, as we return from the holiday. With that, uh, if anyone has any questions, both Ms. Gavito and Ms. Cuellar are here and they've been working diligently on the actual process of doing it. Which is a comments from the board, Mr. Cortez? I got a couple questions. On the <coughs> Page 16 where it talks about contractors. Uh, in the upcoming year, we're going to start putting out for bid some of the, the new uh, school construction. Those specific contractors won't be required to do that because there's not going to be any, any students, right? They're not going to have any contact with kids. Right. These are specific contractors. For example, a, a speech pathologist or someone who's coming in from the outside, a vendor who comes in and actually works with students on specific things. Any contact with students is the primary determiner as to whether they would have a criminal record check or anything like so that. So this won't apply to? Would not apply to construction okay. per se. And the other, the other question I had is where it says uh, substitute teachers and volunteers. So uh, volunteers in the parent centers, mm -hmm. are they going to be required at the start of the year to say, I'm a volunteer here, or is it new volunteers coming in after January 7th that have to do it? If they're already an existing volunteer, would they have to undergo? 
if they're already an existing volunteer, we've already done criminal record checks on them as they were as they came in. It's been standard procedure procedure to do that with substitutes, et cetera. Any new <coughs> persons coming in would certainly be subject to that as well. And I guess my my last question is uh, I didn't see anywhere in here where it said that this, these are going to be done by DPS, the, the checks? Well, we have a record base that we send into that ultimately goes to DPS, but the fingerprint printing itself will be done somewhere in the vicinity of Lindale Pharmacy. I think there's some offices set aside in that building for that purpose. They were the ones who, were, who received the contract from DPS. Okay. So they're a vendor doing I, I that. I guess what I wanted to find out is what's the turnaround time? Because you said that maybe it'll stall uh, if they're delayed, do you know That's what? Anybody's guess, because realize that every single person in the school districts, in every single school district in the state Thanks. of Texas, is everything goes live January 1st. We're not in most districts are not in classes probably until the 7th. So everybody on the 7th is going to go into the system. And the we state have we have no idea the capability and if how that's all going to work. TEA is taking it one day at a time right now to see Austin ISD is currently being used as a pilot in the last few weeks they've been up and live just because TEA is there in Austin and they can work with them they're trying to see that er that there are no kinks in their system right now in these last couple of weeks and, and in the next two weeks they're going to do that but beginning January 1st it is live throughout the entire state of Texas We'll just have to see what the what the downtime will take for for results. And have they given other avenues uh, besides these people down by Lindale or? or no, sir. They're the only ones. There in other. Brown. They're the only other, ones in Brownsville. The, but I mean, okay. So it's it's. A just person could go to McAllen on their own and do it, or some other site that has been designated. But at this time, Lindale Pharmacy <coughs> area is the only place for the Lower Valley. Thank just you. just to follow up on Mr. Cortez's questions, the, the construction workers that are subcontracted by the contractors, they don't have to go through the fingerprinting, but they do go through a background check, correct? Mr. Gonzalez? That is basically up to the contractor to do that anytime they're working around children. But this is basically, this particular law is for those contractors to work directly with children, speech therapists, speech pathologists. Uh, the, the the PT, the, uh, those type of physical therapists, occupational therapists that we contract from the outside that come and work with, those have to do it. Construction contracts are completely different and they're governed by different types. So they do go through background checks through their own companies and we do require them to do that, but this is not part of the same law. Right, right. And, and my second follow-up question, uh, the volunteers, new volunteers would be required to participate in this uh, fingerprinting. Uh, do we expect a significant drop, say, in the parental involvement volunteers because of the fee that they have to pay? I would think so. Uh, anytime, anytime you look at this, one thing that I want to explain and make it very clear because I know a lot of people are listening into it is it's going to be $52 and it's up to the uh, potential employee to pay or the volunteer to pay. It is not the district responsibility to pay. The person that wants to be the volunteer, the person that wants to work for the district has to pay the $52. Hopefully it won't take a, uh, make a big impact on our parental uh, volunteers. If I might add, the current volunteers that we have just go through a name-based mm -hmm. check. So we should not lose any of the current volunteers that we're having. It might diminish the number of people who apply to be volunteers, volunteers in the future, anyway. but the right. current base of volunteers should not be affected. All right, Mr. Uh, Aguilar. Uh, just a question. I know there are volunteers or volunteers. You'll have all kinds of volunteers. I'm concerned about uh, those during, let's say, for instance, the uh, library book uh, week when they ask people to come and read to the classes are they also being included? Uh, or, or, or people that work on programs with the school districts, such as, let's say, uh, PASS or uh, uh, Project Grad, all those people that come and work within the school district, they're also going to be affected by this law? 
Yes, sir. The last group that you mentioned, because they would fall under the contractor mm -hmm. section. Can, it, on page 18, the very last item that's there lists campus visitors, and those would be more like what you're talking about reading during library week or something like those would be once in a while, one time, twice, two times a year, that the campus has individual policies for that where they come in to visit and check in in the office and that sort of thing. That would not fall necessarily under under the fingerprinting someone to come in, say, for reading for library week, once in the fall, once mm -hmm. in the spring. Mm -hmm. Campus procedures would take care of that. But anyone who is coming in, Project Grad and other kinds of projects that come in and work with the children, yes, they would fall under that contractor. So if, if there's like a school a school play or a school activity and, and the school and the teachers require some parent volunteers, those parent volunteers aren't going to be required to, to undergo this uh, the same criteria? It's going to kind of depend on how many volunteer activities. Are they going to come in as, as they do now, just they get approved at the beginning of the year and then they have access to the campus? Or is, as Mr. Aguilar suggested, reading for the library during yeah. Children's Book Week? That's a one time a year thing. Depending on what the individual campus has scheduled, the frequency of visits will determine the, no, the amount of fingerprinting and or name-based checks that need to be done. Mr. Aguilar? And I'm pretty sure we're going to have all kinds of guidelines in addition. They'll do, they're good. I mean, they're very good at it. We are pretty good at it. Uh, I just kind of uh, share this concern that sometimes we, some of them are going to fall to the cracks because, well, he said volunteer is going to be a couple of times this week, and before it's no longer once a week, it's perhaps five, seven, or eight times a week. Mm -hmm. And those are the things that we need to be careful. Uh, because we, it's human nature. We're just human beings. Say, ah, it's okay. I know that person for so many years and whatnot. And before you know it, that occasionally volunteer becomes a permanent volunteer at the campus. And, and, and we don't want to have any loopholes or fall between the cracks. Uh, that will be one of the things we'll be looking at working with the AAs and the principals will be to strengthen our, our guidelines and policies for volunteers coming into the, into the schools at, at any time. Safety is the primary issue for our students, and that's the reason be behind the Senate Bill 9 anyway. So we will continue to look at our campus-based procedures and policies for volunteers. Yes, Mr. Aguilar? And it would be nice if somehow after they have reviewed all those procedures on campus to bring it up before the policy committee to review some of those. And no we problem. Can do, we can certainly do that. We can certainly do that. That's not a problem. Any other questions, Mr. Lehman? Yes, sir. Mr. Gonzalez, is the, um, uh, I take it the, that existing uh, certified employees are exempt from, from fingerprinting? Not, in, not in, in its entirety. Eventually, we will get everybody. So are we, we are going to fingerprint all existing employees that yes. are certified? Yes, we are. By September 11th, 2011. So there's a compliance. Okay, because I'm... I, now the, the contradiction the, the, there. The okay. good thing about that is that current employees, their current current employees, will the state will give us money to pay for them. Okay. The new ones are the ones that are going to have to pay out of their own pocket. And, and is this uh, electronic? I mean, fingerprinting electronic or old-fashioned ink pad? Just out of curiosity. Electronic. I electronic, I believe. It's like the one we have out there. Digital. 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 There's a lot of problems with the ink padding, believe me. It's so, digital. And if the state is, if this is a state-wide uh, initiative, that would be, you know, the system will be bogged down. But anyway, okay. And well, we so. hope that the, the pharmacy that's been contracted by DPS will be able, they'll have trained personnel there that will know exactly how to do it to be able to get the fingerprints in. And, and Happy the Clown uh, won't, won't have to uh, apply, right, since he's dealing with kids. If, he's de if anybody is contracting, dealing directly with kids, the contractor will have to okay. get the so fingerprint. No. Okay, thank you. Happy will. Mr. <laughs> <Sorry, Lara. laughs> uh, Mr. Mr. Gonzalez, uh, I know, but the certified person will be, uh, we'll get to them by 2011, yes. which eventually we will. Does the law provide any volunteering wor uh, volunteers to where they can do it before 2011? 11, that some of our employees might want to volunteer to have it printed so it's fit out there so we don't have to wait until 2011. I mean, I'm sure it, as, as, as the law comes and it unfolds, as they say, uh, we'll be able to do some things. You know, right now the state just, I don't know how they're going to expect to process as many people as they can through the online system. 
I, I, I'm sure they'll set out a program once they, they, they come by and see the first six months of operation and see how this is going to be working. It's going to be heavy use because everybody has to go do it. So once we start getting, I'm sure some guidelines will come out and we'll get a little bit more direction from the state. But right now, <coughs> they sort of just passed the law and says you have to do it starting January 1st, mm -hmm. and and we're moving on it. And when we ask and call the, the, the questions to them, they themselves are hesitant to give us a clear-cut answer because they're trying to see how they can implement it the best way. Yeah, and, and I know I'm pretty sure that at the beginning everybody's going to be rushing. Yes. But eventually, once we go in, for <coughs> if we have volunteers, that will speed up our process, and yes. we'll get there before 2011. Hope to. Mr. Lehman? Uh, I forgot to ask. Uh, board members are what? Exempt? You are elected officials. Does it mean that uh, we might be clear? You probably will be fingerprinted, sir. We're overworking, underpaid. Mm -hmm. Mr. Powers? Yeah, I'll just that's one of my questions. I think uh, January 1st, I think every one of us is going to have to do the background check and fingerprint, which I would rec I would recommend, too. So Definitely. lead by the example. Yes. I agree you should be the that. first ones to do it, right. Powers. I agree. We already register with DPS? Because I am. I'm an FBI. I'm an FBI. I don't know. It took me one year to get my fingerprints. I wouldn't take them. They turned you right now. <laughs> oh, boy. We are going. Uh, Mr. President, just, uh, Ms. Mr. Gonzalez, make sure <laughs> that we're delivered the package so we can do the uh, fingerprints and the background check on the board members. Sure. Okay. Glad to. Ms. Fox, can you yeah, please? I'll take care of <laughs> Any other questions or comments from the board? <laughs> okay, Mr. Colunga, Mr. Levant, thank you for joining us. Moving on to item two, presentation of class of 1944, 1945, and 1946, donation for BISD Museum, Mr. Gonzalez. Thank you, Dr. Scoyle, members of the board. I don't know if there's anybody from that class in our audience today. Uh, Ms. Uh, Betty Rusterberg Stevenson came by uh, my office and, and wanted to give us a donation and we just felt it was we couldn't go without recognizing those classes of um, 1944 45 and 46. they invited me to to visit with them they had their class reunions at the uh there at the cab there at the old brownsville high school which is now central administrative building and they just had a lot of joy in in meeting there and seeing the museum and and seeing the things that were going on and so I just wanted to recognize those classes. They had a real fun time out there. They pitched money together and they gave $500 to BISD uh, to help out in the museum. So we just wanted to acknowledge them and thank them because they, they are wonderful people and they're very excited about the BISD museum and they gave us a $500 check and I wanted to accept it on behalf of BISD and recognize the class of 44, 45, and 46. Thank you, Mr. Gonzalez. Mr. Aguilar? Yes, I, I think it's very wonderful of them to be donating some of the money they raised. Also, but, uh, the class of 57, uh, I believe, uh, donated a, a bench, about a $1,200 bench for the cap. Uh, I thought I'd mention that also right. at this point. Any other questions or comments? Uh, again, thank you to all the classes of 44, 45, 46, and 50 what, Mr.? 57, sir. 57, and to everyone that has participated in this museum. Uh, moving on to item three, presentation of retirement for Lorenzo Sanchez, Chief Financial Officer, Mr. Gonzalez. Thank you, Dr. Scoelho, members of the board. You know, I've known Mr. Sanchez for quite a few years, and and uh, it's rare that we get an opportunity to recognize the accomplishments of a longtime educator. Uh, you know, we, we, we look around and say, how long has Mr. Sanchez been around? <laughs> for a long time. 43 years in education. That's a wonderful accomplishment itself. Uh, a lot of people have known Mr. Sanchez throughout the years. Uh, as, I, as I researched a little bit and I looked around, uh, people that I work with, for example, my secretary, Lucy, said, well, he was my government teacher. And you know, when we look at it, how many titles has Lorenzo really had? He started out as an educator. He started out as a teacher. 
you know, I, I, I went to a retirement luncheon for him in his honor and Mr. Zaldania, which now has gray hairs also like the rest of us, <laughs> said I called him coach. He has influenced so many individuals in this community. It's not, it's rare, it, I'd rather say it's rare to see somebody stay in education for 43 years and have the impact he has had in education. Not only has he had it as a teacher, as a coach, he's done post-secondary, as we all know. He has restructured at the university level. He has worked not only as a CFO, but I also know he's worked in HR. He has done things to impact students. When we look at a CFO, we only look at he's the finance guy. But he's not, Lorenzo is not the finance guy. Lorenzo is a true educator. It's going to be rare to find another individual that has his background. It's rare to find somebody that has been a teacher, a coach, post-secondary, that is also a financial person. He's not only a financial person, he has a CPA. He brings a lot to the table. He has brought a lot to the table. We had some shaky moments in BISD, and we all know, and we recognize those. One thing I can say about Lorenzo is he brought integrity back to the CFO. That's one thing we can never shy away from, the integrity that he brought. Since he took over, we've had nothing but superior ratings when it comes to finance. He has built up a fund balance that was very low to one of the best in the state. That's, a, that's something to be acknowledged and not something to just let slip by. He's the type of person that when I came into the superintendency, I had, you know, I took, I didn't, I, I had to have somebody take over in operations. I had Ms. Fox, they had knowledge in areas, and I asked Lorenzo to take over in facilities. He didn't ask me, how much are you going to pay me? He just said, sure. Then I needed somebody to help me out in athletics. Once again, he didn't ask me how much you're going to pay me. He said, sure. And he did it for the love of kids. And we all know that. So, you know, it's a great honor. And like I said, Mr. Sanchez has been called a lot of names. Some, Dr. No, alias Dr. No. <laughs> and he said no to a lot of things, but that was only to help us stay out of trouble. And we appreciate that, Lorenzo. But I think the best title anybody can give you is being a friend, and you're truly a friend. Thank you. I just want to read a little bit that the Brownsville Independent School District Board of Trustees and Administration gratefully acknowledge the multitude of contributions made by Lorenzo Sanchez during his tenure as Chief Financial Officer, 2003 to 2010. Thank you, Lorenzo. enough time. <laughs> uh, I really uh, have enjoyed uh, my, my tenure here my last four years. Um, I told Mr. Gonzalez the other day that uh, we're leaving BISD in good hands. Uh, you have a lot of good people here, a lot of professional people, the AAs, your department heads, supervisors. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm telling him and I'm trying to convince everyone that uh, the same story. One thing, I guess, consistency is is is, is part of uh, what I believe in, and, and I keep saying, well, with all the things that the board has approved in terms of facilities, I think we're going to be turning the corner in athletics, and I strongly believe that we're going to be turning the corner if we're not just there on, on the academic side. So uh, I'm I'm glad to have contributed some to the district, 
And again, as I mentioned before, I'll still be around and available. So thank you. Thank you, Lorenzo. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Gonzalez and Mr. Sanchez. Congratulations on your retirement and on lasting so long in the educational field. 43 years is a little above average, I think. Uh, congratulations. Any comments from the board? I just want to put things in perspective. You know, uh, we have a, a, a deputy, and uh, Deputy Gonzalez uh, wasn't even born when Lorenzo started in education. <laughs> And I think Dr. Cavazos was just born when Lorenzo started in education. That tells you the perspective of how long Lorenzo has been in education. A lot of us were not born. When <laughs> <laughs> the board president. The board president was not born. Mr. Mr. Aguilar? I was going to say the television is old, man. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, we're that's not number, telling him anything he doesn't already know, right? That's education. <laughs> okay, moving on to item four. Presentation of the Brownsville Independent School District financial report for the period ended October 31st, 2007. Mr. Gonzalez. Thank you. Uh, uh, the report is there for, and available to you. And of course, Mr. Sanchez has not retired officially yet, so he's here to answer any questions you might have. Questions or comments from the board? If not, we move on to item five. Presentation of credit hours for Board of Trustees, Mr. Gonzalez. Thank you, Dr. Escobedo. I believe that uh, every year as required by law, we must report the number of hours that you received in training, and it's up to the board president to to read those hours. Uh, do we have those? And let me tell you just a little brief explanation. In case your hours are not all there, these are according to TASB. The hours that you just got for this board workshop are not there, but you will get credit for those. Also, if you went to the national conventions and you did not turn in those those uh, forms to TASB, they're not there, but you can bring them in and we'll send them to you. If you misplaced them, all you have to do is come back to our office and, and certify that you went to certain sessions and we'll send them to TASB and you will get those credit hours. But let me just say, before Mr. Dr. Escobedo reads them out, all of you are in total compliance. Not a problem. Thanks, Mr. Gonzalez. I'm going to read the, the name of the trustee and the total hours for the term. Mm -hmm. And of course, everybody's complete. Uh, Mr. Rondo Aguilar, 96.25 hours. Mr. Joe Colunga, 100.75 hours. Mr. Ruben Cortez, 44 hours. Uh, Enrique Escobedo, 113.75 hours. Mr. Susan, Susan Galvan, 87.25 hours. Mr. Pat Lehman, 250.25 hours. Uh, Herman Otis Powers, 133 hours. And everyone is complete. Yes. Mr. President. Uh, just like, uh, thank you, Dr. Squill. Just like uh, Mr. Gonzalez said that this, uh, some of them do not, have not been reported, and I'm just looking at my hours. In fact, I checked to the uh, internet also. The uh, two conferences in San Antonio in June and July are not recorded here in my, uh, mm -hmm. my records. That's a total of 10 hours. And the reason we're going to correct, and Lucy's already working on it, is because we have travel, mm -hmm. and there's days where we got out of town and they don't show up in the conference. Perhaps we might give an indication, well, you're going to a conference and you didn't attend those sessions. There will be someone questioning as to why, if you attend a conference, your number of hours <coughs> not recorded. Secondly, if I sit, sit for an hour and a half and uh, five hours a day to listen to someone, and they're not here, definitely I'm going to start looking for those hours and uh, they may make sure they're recorded. <laughs> but uh, I learned my lesson. I always <laughs> take it for granted that the, that the uh, test is going to record them. And they missed two conferences, the one that uh, he and I went in the curriculum, was it? Uh, and the other one is the regular winter. So uh, in the future, what we're going to do is save our copy. Yeah. Yeah, may I make, make a suggestion? There's a copy. And I, I usually turn it in to your office, and they, your office should mm -hmm. double check against whatever TASB has registered, and that's very simple. And, and uh, that would uh, be a check and balance. Uh, yes, and also I think it would be a good practice if our secretary, right after a conference, requests those copies and have a folder 
uh, with us that to, to, to turn it in, you know, because, you know, I took it for granted. And, uh, you know, it's, I know there's somewhere around the house because I did find the San Diego and, and the Chicago and this and all those conferences. And Lucy, uh, she needs to give me the one from San Francisco uh, f uh, for those records because I do have the catalog and the, and the uh, yeah. sessions marked. But uh, I, I think it would uh, be a good price also if our secretary would, right after a conference we attend, that r request that copy that Mr. Lehman is, yes, there's a pink copy the, or yellow copy. That's a, uh, uh, yes, yellow copy. And, and the nationals, uh, you have to request. One's not given to you, you have to request it. So and I think we should have one. I think we have one on file. Okay. Yeah, uh, yes, those on file, they're given to the district rather than to the uh, national conference. You're right. Good point. Any other questions or comments? Now we move on to B, standing board agenda item, seven board calendars, Mr. Gonzalez. Number six. Number six, please. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, number six, uh, presentation of monthly report of the BISD Bond Oversight Committee, Mr. Gonzalez. Thank you, uh, Dr. Escuela, members of the board. I, I just want to announce a couple of changes before uh, I address this. This one is that uh, from now on, because Mr. Sanchez is going to be gone, the one that's going to be working with the Bond Oversight Committee is Mr. Brett Springston and on his official now as, as the Assistant Superintendent for Operations, I'm going to call on him to introduce the new members of the Bond Oversight Committee they will be presenting. Mr. Springston. Thank you, Mr. Gonzalez, <coughs> President Escobedo, members of the board. Uh, here today, I believe Rick Zayas is Mr. now our standing president for the Bond Oversight Committee and is here to give us a short presentation. Thank you. Superintendent, uh, President, and uh, bond board members, uh, my name is Richard Zayas. I am the committee chairman of the Bond Oversight Committee. As you are aware, the Bond Oversight Committee was set in so that people of the public that were appointed by the board members could <laughs> overlook the m funds that were being spent on, uh, on the bond projects. Um, these projects were voted by the public in four propositions to be spent in a certain way as, as required by law. Uh, the two new members, we had a meeting on uh, December 6, 2007. We had two new members that were appointed. It was Hector Hernandez and Moises Gonzalez. And I want to commend these gentlemen for accepting the appointment. It is a commitment. It does take time from our daily schedules. And these gentlemen, uh, along with the rest of the, of the committee members, have taken uh, taken upon themselves to uh, to go forward with this uh, appointment. Uh, the last meeting that we had, there was uh, presentations done by uh, Oscar Garcia, part of the superintendent staff, uh, and uh, the rest of the staff. Uh, they gave us some background on the ADA projects that are part of the bond, the fire alarm projects, the HVAC projects, the re-roofing projects, and the windstorm upgrade projects. So there was a lot of information that was presented to the Bond Oversight Committee, and uh, I want to commend the superintendent staff for giving us a lot of information. There's a lot of good detailed information, financial reports that are given to us. There's a lot of uh, uh, education on the part of the, of the, of the committee members. and. This, uh, there's a lot of dialogue, a lot of questions being asked, and a lot of information being given by the superintendent staff, and I want to commend them for that. Uh, we are not going to meet in January. Uh, apparently, there's not going to be much going on during the holidays, so we decided to meet on the, I believe it's the first Thursday of February. is going to be the next bond uh, meeting, bond oversight committee meeting. And uh, committee members are excited about it because there's going to be a lot of fi uh, finalizing of plans and specifications, and there's going to be a lot of uh, a lot of projects that are going to be coming up before us in this next year. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you all. Thank you. Questions or comments from the board? Thank you, uh, Mr. Cortez. I just wanted to congratulate Mr. Zayas on uh, being elected uh, the chairman of the Bond Oversight Committee. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zayas. Moving on to uh, B, standing board agenda items, seven board calendars, Mr. Gonzalez. Thank you, Dr. Square, the members of the board. You all know we're, this is the end of the first semester. Thursday is the last day for students, and we have a teacher preparation day on Friday, and that completes, completes semester one for this year. Um, we have a, of course, the following two weeks are, we're off for the, for the winter break. Uh, 
uh, we call it Christmas holidays, winter break. And we'll, the teachers will come back on January the 7th, and we'll have those of you that, 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 that want to go visit campuses, you're more than welcome to come back and visit. We have staff development day on the 7th and, and uh, for the campus, so they'll be at the campuses, and we'll have district staff development on the 8th. If you want to, you can call uh, public information on the 7th if you want to see what's going to be happening at the district level on the 8th, so you can go by and visit if you so desire. Uh, also, I just want to mention that new, new teacher in-service will be on January 12th. We only have one board meeting for January that's scheduled, of course, if, if the board president desires and we need to have a special core board meeting, we can. But uh, the board meeting will be on January 15th right here at the boardroom. And uh, at that time, I will bring you up to date uh, on other events that are going to come up in January and February. I just want to say uh, let's have a good holiday season and enjoy our holiday. Thank you, Mr. Gonzalez. Any comments, questions? Mr. Mr. Gonzalez, Mr. Cortez. I just want to make a comment. Uh, I can't recall what day. I want to say it was Friday Friday night. I went to Lopez High School. They had their first annual bash at the theater. I just wanted to commend the students over there. They did a fantastic job putting that production together. Thank you, Mr. Cortez. Moving on to item eight, public audience. The next item on our agenda is a public comment period. This is the time for citizens, staff, or students to provide their comments to the board. Statements and questions from the audience will not be permitted during other portions of the meetings, so please let us hear from you now if you, wish, if you have comments to present. To have, your, to have your comments heard tonight, your name and subject matter uh, must appear in the sign-in sheet, which is located in the rear of our meeting room. Each speaker will be limited to five minutes to complete his or her comments, and without decourtesy, I will strictly enforce the time limit. If a group of people want to be heard on the same topic, the board asks that they designate a spokesperson to avoid needless repetition. The board has adopted rules to preclude the abuse of open forum by, for example, anyone uselessly repeating the same comment or complaint meeting after meeting. All participants must understand that if you come in my judgment, constitute a complaint against an employee or an officer. I will interrupt you and ask, uh, I will ask you to stop and direct you to proceed. Uh, with the BISD formal grievance procedures, be that DGBA, FNG, or GF local. With those cautions in mind, we will now be glad to hear your general comments. Our next, our first uh, speaker is uh, Orlando Trevino. Um, there is no subject to be discussed. General comments, okay. <laughs> no, well, three things first. Uh, congratulations on Mr. Lorenzo Sanchez. And for you being 43 years in education, you ain't got gray hair. You had to have colored it all these years. <laughs> uh, going to uh, Mr. Aguilar, you mentioned 57. Did you graduate in year 1957? No, sir. <laughs> Before and then for, uh, <laughs> for Pat Lehman, well, if anybody uh, you are short on uh, continuing education credits or whatever, he's got a lot of them. <laughs> so, but uh, no, the reason I, I do this every year, I'll, uh, Mr. Board President, uh, Board Members, Superintendent Hector Gonzalez, Administration, Public. What I'd like to all, uh, wish you all is a very Merry Christmas and a very safe, Happy New Year. I prefer to see, I, I would like to see you here. I want to wish all employees, all students, Everybody in BISD, a Merry Christmas, is, but like I say, the most important thing is a safe and happy new year. Uh, what can I say? I do this every year, I, I, and since this is watched all around Brownsville, I'd like to wish all of Brownsville a uh, happy new year because and a Merry Christmas because we all live here. And Mr. Superintendent, board members, you all are doing an excellent job. I can take a look at it just from watching uh, reports and everything else where uh, the high schools and everything else, more recommendations, more, uh, you name it, uh, uh, scores going up. So I congratulate you all and your, the administration, principals, teachers, everybody from bus drivers to everybody because this is a team effort. And without all those people, you couldn't get done what you all are getting done. So I want to congratulate you once again. Continue doing a good job, and we'll see you uh, about the fourth or fifth of next year or the first uh, school board meeting. But once again, I want to wish everybody a Merry Christmas and a happy and safe New Year. Thank you very much. That's for you and your families. Thank you, Mr. Trevino, and happy holidays to you too. Our 
Next and final speaker is Alberto Alegria, conference wish list and elections. Good evening, members of the board, President Escobedo, Superintendent Gonzalez, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Alberto Alegria, the proud and humble president of the Association of Brownsville Educators, representing 2,614 members and employees in BISD. First, a comment on a conference that I attended. Recently, a colleague and I attended a TAFER uh, state conference in Galveston, Texas. To my astonishment, we felt that we were alone representing BISD's uh, physical education department. A conference of this caliber is intended for kinesiology teachers to acquire knowledge of the latest games, activities, and strategies, especially now that we have to implement core subjects, uh, strategies into our physical education curriculum to best prepare our students, not only physically as well as mental. Uh, we must stop financially stuffing all other programs and start placing more emphasis on allocating money to purchase basic physical education equipment at all campus levels and allocate more money for training our physical education instructors so that they may become superior motivators for a healthier student and ultimate, ultimately a better tax taker. AOB Christmas wish list. We, the Association of Brownsville Educators, would like to present to administration and our school board members our following Christmas wish list. First and foremost, we wish to establish or maintain a prof professional respect for one another at all levels of employment within the Brownsville Independent School District. We must respect each other in our employment place and work in a positive and professional manner, especially when things get a little crazy. Often we go through life expecting to get a fair shake. All there is to be said is we must all be treated on a level playing field when it comes to hiring, firing, promotion, demotion, and grievances because it is the proper thing to do and school policy confirms that assurance. As we are faced with, with decisions at all levels, we must, we must demonstrate a loving heart and not a judgmental mind. We, the employees of the Brownsville Independent School District, must set the example by being a role model and working together to best service our students because we are all associated in education and dedicated professionals in the best employment status. We wish administration to recommend to our school board an increase in all BIZ stipends for the 2008-2009 school year. On a daily basis, we have educators from all grade levels and subjects participating in extra duty and working their prospective positions responsibly for BISD. These positions are awarded or assigned to employees for duties valued to their profession. However, many more extra hours are required than the regular assignment meets the eye. I don't have to tell you the excessive hours spent, for example, football coaches in high school to elementary dance teachers. In this particular scenario, a football coach is paid a stipend, however, the elementary dance instructor is not. We, the Association of Brownsville Educators, want to change both scenarios. Increase the coach, coach's stipend and institute a stipend for those elementary teachers that spend countless hours after school, after school teaching our young students. We haven't visited and had discussions about increases of stipends in many years. Let's get together, find a reasonable and an affordable increase for all of these durable overtime working educators. Let's change that scenario. We wish administration to, inc to increase and not decrease the employees' workforce needed to prepare, serve, and clean our, our school cafeterias. Recently, a rash of cutbacks in employees' workforce has placed an enormous quantity of pressure on cafeteria managers to produce more manpower hours with less manpower. We, the Association of Brownsville, uh, believe that this scenario is an invitation for potential work-related accidents. Upper management calculates manpower by student to food preparation hour. This issue is, uh, this is the issue that they also calculate managers and custodial into the calculation of food preparation. We, the Association of Brownsville Educators, do not feel this calculation is correct or makes any sense. A manager should manage the employees preparing the food for our students and the custodial person prepares the eating area. We must change the manner in which food service administrators, supervisors calculate the man hour and how they determine who can or who can't be figured into the food preparation mix. This scenario needs a change. We wish administration to, purport, uh, to 
Number four, we wish administration to propose to our school board the consideration of free clinics for all BISD employees. We, the Association of Brownsville Educators, will continue to support the concept of establishing this medical concept because it's a good idea and can save money for the district. Although there are many misconceptions about the clinics, we, the, we, the Brownsville Education, we, the Brownsville Independent School District employees, have not Closing been given comments, sir. Have, have not been given a valid presentation. All right. Closing comments. All right, your, your, your time's up. Thank you very much. Moving on to item nine, consent agenda. I have received a list from my colleagues indicating that there is a need to discuss and or deliberate the following agenda item. Under D, recommend approval of the following contracts agreements, number 10, I'm, I'm sorry, number 18. And under personnel matters, 33 and 34. So 18, 33, and 34, all others are consent agenda. Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Motion by Mrs. Uh, Galvan, seconded by Mr. Aguilar. All in favor, raise your right hand. Motion passed unanimously. Mr. President, let the record reflect I'm abstaining on 32, and I'm approving all the rest, as mentioned. Okay, so you're abstaining on 32. Yes. So noted. Item 18, recommend approval to enter into an interlocal agreement with the University of Texas at Austin, the K-16 Educational Center, part of the Continuing Education Lucha Project for the 2007-2008 school year in the amount of $132,000. Services to be rendered subject to the district's needs and funding. Mr. Aguilar, I'll open the floor for discussion. Thank you, Dr. Escobedo. Uh, I would like to hear some background on this program. Mr. Gonzalez, perhaps the bilingual people or whoever's in charge of this can tell us about this program. Mr. Gonzalez? Yes, Dr. Escobedo, members of the board, Mr. Aguilar, sure. Um, you know, Project Lucha is, is something that is going on right now as a pilot program at Pace High School. And it's basically a, an, uh, a tool that's going to be used to give credit to those students that are coming in from Mexico with high school preparatoria and be able to get them credits here that are equivalent to high school credits here and at the same time be able to, so they, can, they won't lose that credit and, won't, and hopefully will graduate from a high school when they come here. But to give you a better understanding, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Cavazos, our Assistant Superintendent for Recruitment and Instruction, and he may call on, on uh, Mary, Maria Gonzalez for bilingual ed to give you a better uh, prospect of this. Dr. Cavazos. Superintendent Gonzalez, uh, President Dr. Escobedo, and members of the board, this is a wonderful collaboration that we have with the University of Texas to be able to work with our youth, as Mr. Gonzalez shared, that are coming from uh, uh, different countries, especially in this case, Mexico, and be able to do transcript analysis in the sense that students that have acquired um, courses and credits uh, in Mexico, that we can uh, utilize the efforts of the University of Texas to uh, ensure that these classes are aligned with the classes that we um, teach in our schools. And so it's a great incentive for students to not have to repeat those courses and a great incentive for students to stay in school and graduate from high school. In this case, we have had our administrator for bilingual ed in our district that have been leading this project, and Maria Gonzalez will come to the podium at this time. Good evening, uh, Mr. Gonzalez, Board President Estoedo, members of the board. My voice is a little bit off. I did do some laryngitis. But this is a very exciting project whose goal really is to increase the graduation rate. And what it'll do, it'll provide, as mentioned, transcript analysis of the students that are recent immigrants that have coursework completed from Mexico. UT in Austin has an initiative where they've already made connections through the Department of Education in Mexico and having, a, in a way, accredited uh, institutions in Mexico that provide courses that are aligned to our Texas essential knowledge and skills. They've done the legwork and have identified those courses that qualify for awarding of credits towards graduation. And what we've done in uh, researching this project, uh, we have a representative from UTA, uh, Ana Cruz, who is here, who provides technical support for the project. The project has been in place since last year in the Valley in places like Ed Couch, PSJA, and Donna. This year, another 10 districts joined Austin, Dallas, Houston, Aleve, numerous. 
because they can see the benefit of awarding credits to the kids that come by analyzing their coursework. This frees up their schedule, since they have these credits awarded, frees up their schedule to develop then their English language. Okay? So that's the intent of the project, to analyze their credit, award them credit that counts towards graduation, and free up their schedule to develop more of their English language development. Mr. Aguilar? Um, who has been analyzing the uh, credits in the past, Mrs. Gonzalez? In our district, to date, uh, students come and uh, our attendance office looks at the report cards, whatever they bring with them, and then uh, recommends placement. But at the campus level, that's where placement is, uh, is determined, whether it be middle school, high school, so forth. Historically, have we ever misplaced anyone? Mm, misplaced, no. Most of the students do function at the grade levels that they are assigned. They work through the text and so forth. Yeah. But this will accelerate that placement. And again, the courses that uh, they're going to offer, what kind of courses are they going to offer be besides Spanish? Uh, the courses that they offer are all the courses, things like algebra, geometry, algebra 2, biology, chemistry, physics, all courses that count towards graduation. And will they be taught in English or Spanish language, ma'am? Uh, what happens, they analyze a transcript based on what they bring from Mexico. All the courses that they come with will be analyzed and they will be awarded credit in all the coursework that they bring with them in the core areas. English will not be one of the courses that they'll get credit for because we want to develop that language here in Brownsville. But then when they come here, what we are also trying out, apart from the transcript analysis that will occur at all five high schools, and we've identified this past year 250 recent immigrants who will have their transcript analyzed and will get uh, credit awarded for this knowledge that they bring. Dr. Felipe Lanis is the dean of this institution that, has, uh, that is at the forefront of this. He used to be commissioner of education for TEA. He, his favorite quote is, knowledge has no language. Once you know algebra, you know algebra. What you need then is the language development, uh, the English, okay? But a warning of credit has already occurred. Uh, the project also has with it modules that the students can work through so that as they are taking, for example, economics at the high school level, they can go to a Lucha lab and take that same course that has already been aligned to the text and has the assessments that are tax formatted already in Spanish so that they'll take the course and they'll also get support in Spanish uh, understanding of the concepts and at the course they will have development of the English. So, so at this point, you don't have the list of courses that uh, yes. are being offered online? Oh, yes, sir. We have the list of Besides, courses. Uh, economics. Yes. Uh, there are several, as I mentioned, algebra, uh, geometry, algebra 2, biology, chemistry, physics, G GMO, which is the geology, meteorology, oceanography, economics, and business computer information systems. So there but are several. You said that you were going to evaluate the transcript. Yes. Because if they do algebra, geometry, whatever, they would, provide it, they would be provided credit yes. at the high school, right? Yes, sir. So actually the algebra course that is there probably would be an advanced course? Yes, it could be an advanced course. Let's say they didn't get credit for that course from Mexico. Mm -hmm. They would take it here through an online uh, module. Mm -hmm. But the transcript analysis will list the courses based on what are the requirements in Texas mm -hmm. to graduate. It will list all the courses. It'll list what they're, based on the transcript analysis, what they're getting credit for, mm -hmm. and it'll assign a grade. Since the courses have all been uh, aligned to the text, mm -hmm. it'll assign a grade for those students, and it'll list for them a personal graduation plan as to what courses they are missing. And those missing courses are the ones that they would take in our high school and get support through online modules in Spanish for continuing concept development. Your experience, can you tell us how many students are we talking about? Well, we've identified 250 <laughs> students that are recent immigrants within the past two years that we're going to take through this process of the transcript analysis, <laughs> see how many credits they gather, and then see how that frees up their schedule to develop more English language development and prepare for the tax. So okay. we're looking at about 250 students across the five high schools. So those 250 students, you might have already have a transcript, do you? 
I'll mo that's what our intent is, that once with your approval, mm -hmm. we will talk to the students, they'll bring their transcripts, they'll be analyzed by UT Austin, assign credits, and then we'll look at uh, the following steps. But because what they're doing here is charging you $140 for a transcript. <laughs> And I, I thought we already had very good relationship with Mexico and uh, with, through the Council Mexicano. And then we go to a conference in Mexico City, and they always say there's no problem getting a kid's transcript. And now I see this, and uh, it makes me wonder, all this year been working with our relationship with Mexico, and then said, yes. uh, this is going to work better. What this has done, Mr. Aguilar, is in a sense done the legwork in, in identifying the institutions in Mexico, because as you know, they have a lot of different levels of institutions, everything from private, public, and so forth. And what they have done through UT Austin, they've collected through the U.S. Department of Ed in Mexico, they've collected the courses, syllabuses, what is it really that they're delivering as far as instruction, and compared that rigor to our text. So that if we are going to award credit for that course, that rigor is there, that it aligns to our text and will help our kids, uh, that it is a valid credit <coughs> towards graduation. So right now for us as an entity, BISD, to uh, take on that task would be monumental. Uh, we do look definitely at the student, what they bring with them, the report card and so forth, but these, uh, col this collaborative that, that has been set up through the UT Austin has done a lot of that legwork in making sure that the coursework that the kids are bringing does align to our Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills and we can award credit towards graduation. Any other, que any other questions or comments? Thank you, Dr. Cavazos. Thank you, Mrs. Gonzalez. Uh, all in favor, do I have a motion to approve item 18? Okay. I have a motion by Mrs. Galvan, seconded by Mr. Powers. All in favor, raise your right hand. Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Moving on to item 10, closed meeting as pursuant to Texas Government Code Section 551.